Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. This morning, we'll continue, of course, our study of the gospel of Matthew. And Matthew presents Jesus as the king of the Jews. And we're, we're almost to a turning point in the ministry of Christ because we've seen that he's going and he's taking the message, but opposition is beginning and it's going to get worse and worse as we go through it. Think about the four Gospels. When, if you think about Mark, Mark presents Jesus as the servant. Luke presents him as a man. John presents him as the son of God. But Matthew presents him as the king of the Jews. And what we've been seeing is we saw, first of all, the background of the king, which is descendant, Jesus' descendant of David and Abraham. We saw the platform of the king, which was the Sermon on the Mount. We've seen the power of the king in which chapters 8, 9, and 10, we saw him continually presenting, uh, showing his power by his miracles. And now we're in what we call the program of the king. And this is where he's teaching, and this is where he's beginning to get the message out. But this morning, we're going to see something that's a little unusual. We're going to see John the Baptist. And John the Baptist, while he's in prison, has some doubts about Jesus. And we could say, wait a minute, John the Baptist? Because John's actually going to say, Jesus, are you the right one or not? And we'd say, well, how could this be? Because John the Baptist is the one that said, there's the Lamb of God. Jesus takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist is the one that baptized Jesus. John the Baptist is the one that saw the Holy Spirit like a dove come down. And, and he's, he's having doubts. Well, let me ask you this. Uh, have you ever had doubts? Sometimes do we doubt things? And we're going to see what Jesus says when people doubt. What do we do when people doubt? We're also going to see something I mentioned, that the, the very last part of this passage, there's, there's a real hard part there just for us to think about it, and we'll see it as we go through it. Well, many times we do have doubts. We doubt about, like if you're a student, where you're going to pass a course. We talk doubt sometimes whether we're going to get a job, or we doubt whether we're going to keep a job, or we doubt whether we're the parents we ought to be. You know, maybe we're not doing all the things we should. Or sometimes even with Christianity, we doubt some of the things in the Bible. We go, gosh, is that true? I, mean, I hope it's true. And sometimes in the Christian life, we doubt, and we say, I hope I'm going to be faithful. I don't know if I'm going to be faithful. I hope I am. We all have doubts. There's a guy named Oz Guinness, and Oz Guinness is a really, he's kind of a brilliant man. And he said this, he said, to believe is to be in one mind about accepting something as true. To disbelieve is to be in one mind about rejecting something. But to doubt is to waver between the two. To doubt is to be in two minds. It's very similar to the Greek word that is the word for anxious. The word anxious it means to be pulled two ways. The word doubt means you're, you're, you're not sure. You, you think maybe this or, or maybe this, or I hope this is true. We doubt things about our life and about our jobs and about our health and about maybe even the Bible sometimes, or we doubt about the Christian life. We doubt a lot. You can see how, uh, how you look at things sure changes it. I think about the nation of Israel when Goliath came out in front of the nation of Israel for those 40 days, and he was 9 feet 9 inches tall, and he challenged the nation of Israel. And some of the soldiers would say, he's so big, how can we kill him? But when David went out there, he said, he's so big, how can I miss him? I mean, you know, think about it. So what are your doubts? Do you doubt about your family? Do you doubt about your health? Do you doubt about God? Do you doubt about the future? I remember I went and talked to a man once, and he, he's a great man, and he was, he was dying in the hospital, and they asked me to go talk to him, and I went in to see him, and, and he looked at me, and he said, I'm just afraid I'm going to lose my faith. And, 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 of course, I said, I don't know what that means. Because <laughs> I said, you have trusted Christ as Savior. He said, yeah, I have eternal you know, I said, you have eternal life. And he said, yeah, I know I do. But at the same time, I don't know what's going to happen. I said, I know, I know. And sometimes we doubt about all kind of things. Well, this morning, I think we're going to see one of the greatest men in the Bible. John the Baptist is actually called the greatest man in the Bible. That may surprise you, but Jesus says that. And he's doubting. He's between two minds. So let me give you sort of the outline of what we're going to look at. Jesus is continuing his ministry. That's 11.1. One. We're just going to look at the first 15 verses this morning. And we'll go fairly quickly. We're going to see John the Baptist, and we're going to see that he doubts. And we're going to see how Jesus answers it. And let me just say this. How Jesus answers this is how you should look at it. When you doubt something... 
we're going to see what does Jesus say to do when you doubt. And we'll talk about that. And then, of course, Jesus describes John. And it gets toward the end. That's really a, a little hard part there. So we want to gain insight. Now, remember where we are. Jesus is continuing his ministry. He's chosen 12 apostles or disciples, is how he's called them at different times. And he's taught them, and he taught them the Sermon on the Mount, and all the people heard. He sent them. He's been doing miracles. He actually sent them out doing miracles. And last time, let me tell you, last week was a really hard passage because he talked about discipleship. And what we understand, and I want you to make sure you got this, salvation is a gift and it costs us nothing. Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid for sin, and rose again. You trust in him and you have eternal life. You're saved forever. Discipleship is where you say, I give you my life. I want to serve you. It's Romans 12 where Paul says, I beseech you, brother. And he's talking to believers to offer your life as a living sacrifice. And we said the discipleship cost. And Jesus said, discipleship cost you your life. You've got to put me first. And you've got to live for me. And we said, you know, there are a lot of believers. I don't think there's a real, real lot of disciples. I know that a lot of you in this room, I know your lives. I know what you say. I, there are some disciples in this room who people have said, I just want my life to count for Christ. So we saw that last time. And it's really, really hard. Well, as we start in verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 1, it says, When Jesus had finished giving the instructions to his disciples, to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. Well, you remember where he is, and we talked about this. He's in the northern part of Israel. He would go down to Jerusalem uh, for the big feast days, but he stayed in this part. Uh, way over here off the map is Nazareth, where he was born and where he basically grew up. But his headquarters are in Capernaum. And so sometimes they'll get on the boat and they'll go to the other side, or they'll go down here, or they'll even go down here, or sometimes they'll walk around, but these are famous cities, Bethsaida and Chorazan, and uh, Magdala, and, and uh, Gadara, remember the Gadarenes where that guy was crazy, two, two guys were in the tombstone, basically, area, and they were crazy, and they were demon-possessed, and Jesus cast out the demons, and the pigs ran down the hill, that was down in Gadara, so this is where Jesus is, and he's doing these miracles, and he's doing the ministry, but notice what it says that he does. He says, when Jesus had finished giving instructions to his 12 disciples, he departed from there to teach and preach in their cities. That's the ministry that we have seen over and over, teaching the word of God and preaching the gospel. And that's what we do. We call it making disciples. There's evangelism and training. Evangelism is proclaiming the gospel, the good news message, so that people can trust in Christ. And then teaching the word is where we're training believers to grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. So what Jesus was doing was basically telling people how to have eternal life and then training them. And that's what we're supposed to do as well. Now watch what happens right in the middle of this. Now when John, while imprisoned, heard of the works of Christ... He sent word by his disciples. Now, who is this John? We call him John the Baptist. I mean, it's not like it was, it's not Baptist denomination. Literally in the Greek, it says John the baptizing one. He became famous because he told people that the kingdom of heaven was at hand and the king was on the earth and people came out to be identified with him. So he baptized them. So he became known as John the baptizing one or as we call him, John the Baptist. He is the one that he knew Jesus. He pointed Jesus out. He said to people, he said, there's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He was baptized and Jesus came up to him and Jesus said, I want you to baptize me to identify me with mankind. And John the Baptist said, well, you ought to baptize me, not me baptize you. And Jesus said, no, do. So this is a guy that baptized Jesus. This is a guy that pointed out that Jesus was the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the guy that said he was the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make the way of the Lord. And we're going to see what happens to him. It says while he was in prison. What happened to him? How did he get into prison? Well, what we find out is that uh, he... He oftentimes, went, Herod was one of the sons of Herod the Great, was, happened to be ruling in that part of the world. And this Herod divorced his wife and married his brother's wife. He did that. And that wasn't right. So John the Baptist went to him and said, that's wrong. You shouldn't be doing that. And so he threw John in prison. And let me show you this. This is uh, in Mark chapter 6. It said, for Herod himself had sent and had John arrested and bound in a prison on account of Herodias, his wife, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it's not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Now John, the Baptist, went up to Herod and said, you shouldn't be married to her because that's your brother's wife and you've done wrong. And so Herod threw him into prison. And so he's in prison now. And uh, later, this same Herod is going to kill John the Baptist. He's going to cut his head off. 
So it doesn't end well in that part, okay? But right now, John is in prison, and here's what he says. Verse 2 again. Now, when John, while in prison, heard of the works of Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the expected one, or shall we look for someone else? Now, the word expected one means the coming one. It's the idea of the Messiah. John is actually saying, are you, are you the Messiah, or should we look for somebody else? Now, we would say, wait a minute, John, how could you even think that way? You, you, how could you doubt this? You, you saw him already. You've called him the Lamb of God. You, how could you even doubt? Well, think about this. He's in prison. He didn't see the kingdom. He thought Jesus was coming as the king, right? And Jesus is going to set up the kingdom. There's no kingdom. There's no judgment. Was Jesus doing all the things that the Messiah was supposed to do? He thought the Messiah was going to come as the king and set up the kingdom. He doesn't see any kingdom. In fact, all he sees is prison. Now, he has seen the dove come down, and he's called him the Lamb of God, so he's beginning to doubt. Remember, he's in two minds. Jesus is the Lamb of God. Where's the kingdom? Where's the power? Where's all the stuff? And he's beginning to doubt. So when he hears what Jesus is doing, he decided that he would find out. So John has begun to waver if Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And let me say this to you. When trials come, when problems come, when things come and they're not expected, sometimes we begin to say, is, is this really right? Does God really love me? Uh, you know, we already know that if you go all the way back to Adam and Eve, God's plan is for you to doubt God's love. Um, excuse me. Satan's plan is for you to doubt God's love and doubt God's word. That's his plan. All the way through. That's what he made Adam. He made Adam and Eve doubt the love of God and the word of God. What he wants you to doubt is God's love. He doesn't. He wants you to say, "I, I don't know if God really loves me. If God really loves me, this wouldn't, this wouldn't happen." He wants you to doubt the word of God. He wants you to say, "Is all this really true?" And so here's what John the Baptist is doing. He's beginning to doubt. He's worried. He says, "I don't. Is Jesus really the right one?" And so he says, "Are you the expected one, or shall we look for one somebody else?" Sometimes, and let me just say this in a nice way: It's okay to doubt. Sometimes our mind says, "I hope that's right." Well, I hope you know. I hope that works out. I hope that's right. So what does what does Jesus do? So it said. And he said to him, are you the expected one or shall we look for someone else? Jesus answered and said to them, now this is the guys that John said. He turns to those guys and says, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised up. And the poor have the gospel preached to them. Now he said, you go back and tell John what you see. He didn't just say, oh yeah, tell him I'm the one. He said, you tell him what you're seeing. And what were they seeing? The blind could see, the lame could walk, the lepers were cleansed, the deaf could hear, the dead are raised up, and the good news message is preached out. And let me tell you what he's doing. He's going going back to Isaiah. He's quoting in this passage Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61. They were prophecy showing the Messiah's ministry. See, he said, John, go look at the Bible. What did the Bible say the Messiah was supposed to do? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, preach the good news message. What do you see happening? Sick are getting well, lame are getting healed, dead are being raised, the gospel's being preached. He says, go back and tell him what you see. And see, the truth is, Jesus pointed John back to the word of God. What do we know? Jesus said, what is the Messiah supposed to be doing? Look at the Bible. What is the Messiah to do? And remember this. He reminds John that when in doubt, go back to the word of God. Because Isaiah said, this is what the Messiah will do. What is Jesus doing? He's doing exactly what the Messiah is doing. Let me tell you, sometimes we doubt things. Sometimes we begin to say, I hope this is right. Sometimes I've had people say, I hope, I hope that there, is there really going to be a rapture? I said, well, let's go to 1 Thessalonians and let's see what it says. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15. Let's see what it says. Let's Let's go to the Bible and see what it says. Go back to the Word of God. So let me just tell you something. Anytime you doubt about anything, go back to the Scripture. There's an old saying that says God's, uh, Christ's blood makes us safe, but God's word makes us sure. We go back to that. Whenever we have doubts, we must go to the source of authority, which is the Bible. 
there was a song years ago uh, by a guy by the name of Edmonds, and he says, my faith has found a resting place, not in device or creed. My faith has found a resting place in the written word of God. That's where we go. We talked a little bit about this in my grow group, and we were talking about what is faith. Faith is taking God at his word. Faith is being persuaded. And the key in faith is not the amount of faith. The key in faith is the object of our faith. The object of our faith for salvation is Jesus Christ. He's the one who died and rose again. We trust in him. The object of our faith for the Christian life is the word of God. We go back to the written scripture. Think about this. If you doubt God's love, the Bible says God so loved the world. If you doubt God's power, realize that nothing can stop him. If you doubt that God cares for you, just remember he'll provide and protect. Think about this. In Romans, he says God is able to do anything that he ever promises. So if you doubt about salvation, if you say, well, I hope I'm going to heaven. First John 5, 13 says, these things were written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may what? What does it say? You may know you have eternal life. You don't have to doubt it. Go back to the word of God. The Bible says when you trust in Jesus Christ, you can know that you have eternal life. John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. That's truth from the Bible. So if you doubt it, go back to the scripture. What about doubt in the Christian life? You say, I hope he takes care of me. Hebrews 13 says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. What should you fear? Philippians 4, 9 says, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. If you say, I hope I, 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 hope, he, I, hope I make it, you're going to make it. He promised you're going to make it. Go back to the word of God, always true. Look what he says. He says, go and, this is again the verse four. Jesus answered and said to them, go and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, lame walk, lepers are cleansed, death hear, dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. That's Isaiah 35. And he said, and blessed is he who does not take offense in me. The word offense has the idea of to trip, to trip up. And sometimes when we doubt, we trip, we trip up, we, we miss it. He says, blessed is a person that doesn't miss me, that doesn't get messed up, that doesn't get confused. Because sometimes people doubt and they just keep on going the wrong way. Sometimes people doubt and they say, I'm going to go back to the Bible because I know what is true. So what does Jesus actually say? Tell John, yes, I'm the right one because I'm doing what God, what the Messiah is supposed to do. The focus is always on the Bible. That's what we got to do. Now, watch what he says after he leaves. Because, you know, some people heard that. And so some people could say, oh, that old John the Baptist is not that great, is he? Yes, he is great. Just because he doubted, does that mean he's not great? Look what he says. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. And they says, what did you, what did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. When you went out to see John the Baptist in the wilderness, and by the way, John the Baptist, out of nowhere, just started proclaiming the message that the kingdom of heaven is his hand and the king is here. And he looked, I mean, his hair, he never cut his hair. He, he ate locusts and wild honey. He had this big belt around his... I mean, people came out there and he was just amazing. He looked like Elijah is what he looked like. And so people came out there and they were just flocking to him. And Jesus said, when you went out to see him, did you see somebody going back and forth? The answer is no. He stood out there and he proclaimed a clear message. And it says, and what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Did he have on nice clothes? I, by the way, I looked up that Greek word for soft there means fancy. It said, did he go out and wear fancy clothes when you went out in the middle of the wilderness? Did you say, no. Those who wear fancy clothes are in king's palaces. What did you go out to see? You know what you went out to see? A prophet. A prophet of God. And he goes on to say, yes, and I tell you, more than just a prophet. I mean, this guy was more than a prophet because a prophet proclaims the word of God, but he's something special. Notice, this is the one about whom it is written. Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will repair, prepare your way before you. See, John the Baptist was the messenger of the forerunner of Jesus Christ. That's who he is. Do you remember when John was out in the wilderness and all these people were coming out there? And so the religious leaders sent some scribes out there, and they said to him, are you the Christ? And he went, no, I'm not the Christ. Are you the Messiah? And he went, no. Are you a particular prophet? And he went, no. He said, who are you? And he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. That's Isaiah chapter 40. John the Baptist said, I'm the, I'm the forerunner of the Messiah. That's who he is. That was his job.
And if you, if you notice right here, he quotes verse 10. In verse 10, he says, This is the one about his written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you. He will prepare your way before you. That's with Malachi. And here's what Malachi 3 1 says Behold, I'm going to send my messenger. That's John. And he will clear the way before me. The me is the Messiah. John was the messenger. John was the voice crying in the wilderness. Look at this. This is Luke chapter 1. This is God telling John the Baptist's daddy what John was going to be like. And he will turn many of the sons back to Israel, to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. He's coming. So John the Baptist is the forerunner. So Jesus says, listen, John doubts. Does that make him not great? Listen, when you went out in the wilderness, did you see somebody going back and forth? No. Did you see somebody in fancy clothes? No. What did you see? You saw a prophet, and not just any prophet. You saw the forerunner of the Messiah that Malachi talked about. You saw John, who is the forerunner of the Messiah. What a ministry. You ever thought about this? We have a ministry. We're ambassadors for Christ. We get to go out these doors... And we proclaim about Jesus Christ. Now, we're sent out as ambassadors. Now, John announced that the Messiah was coming. You and I announce that the Messiah has come and died to pay for our sins. See, the message is a little different. John the Baptist was saying, he's here, he's here. We're saying, he came, he died, he rose again, and he'll give you eternal life. Now, we can also say this, he's coming again. Came the first time to die. He comes the second time to reign as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We have a message. Now watch this next part. Truly I say to you, verse 11, among those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Now we think David's pretty great. We think Moses is pretty great. We think Abraham's pretty great. Jesus said that... Uh, John the Baptist is the greatest. How does our world grow greatness? Well, if you got good education, you got influence and power and money and rank and position. But Jesus says John the Baptist is the greatest. Why? Because he did the will of the Father. He came and fulfilled his ministry. He did what God has for him to do. And you and I can be just the same. Because when you stand before Jesus Christ, what do we want to hear him say? Well done what? Good and faithful servant. John the Baptist is called great because he did what God had for him to do. Now, I'm going to show you something that's amazing. As far as this world is concerned, the greatest one was John. But look at the rest of the verse. He says, Truly, truly, I say to you, among these born of women, there is not one arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. He says, listen... What John did down here is great, but that's nothing compared to what it's going to be like in the kingdom when we all get there with the rewards and the things that God has for us. He's saying being great down here is nothing compared to being in the kingdom of God and being there for Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to say something because, remember, there's conflict going on, so he says this in verse 12. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and violent men take it by force. All he's saying is this. When John began to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ, that he was the, that he was the forerunner, that he was the voice crying in the wilderness, that the Lamb of God was here, that the Messiah was on the earth, he'd been attacked and attacked and attacked, and now he's even in prison. And before it's over, they're going to kill him. And they attack Jesus as well. And so he says, from the days of John the Baptist, when he started his ministry, until now, the kingdom suffers violence. That means that there are people attacking the kingdom. And he says this, that there's been conflict of those in opposition to the kingdom. As we study the Gospel of Matthew, and we get toward more and more toward the end, we're going to see it gets worse and worse and worse and worse. Now, let me just say one other thing, and we've talked about this before. We already know that we have a privilege, and that is to tell this community and this world the message of Jesus Christ. And we've been talking about that it's going to get worse and worse and worse. And that as the years go by, I mean, I can remember 50 years ago when to say I'm a Christian was proudly, oh, this person's a Christian, oh, what a great leader in our community. Nowadays, you stand and say I'm a Christian, they say you're hateful, and you don't love people, and we're against you. And it's going to only get worse. It's not going to get better. You already see it. You see it in the political spectrum. You see it in the country. It's happening. 
And while Jesus was there, as he goes through his ministry, it gets worse and worse and worse, and our ministry is going to get worse and worse and worse. But look what he says, this, this whole aspect until from John's message, he's proclaiming it, and then he goes down to verse 13 and throws this in there. For all the prophets and the law prophesied till John. John was telling that the Messiah was coming. I mean, the other people, John tells the Messiah is here. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The, in the past, they were saying, it's coming, it's coming. Now John says it's here. Now, this next verse is going to be really hard. Because he's saying, listen, John is the best. He's proclaimed the kingdom. There's been all kind of problems. And then he says something in verse 14 that most people, they either, they either miss it or they don't want to, they, they just go past it. Look what he says. And if you are willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. And you go, what, what, what does that mean? What do, you, what do you mean? What do you mean if we accept it? He's saying this. If you accept the message that Jesus is the Messiah, if they believed the message that Jesus was the Messiah, then John the Baptist would fulfill the role of Elijah. Let me show you this. If Israel accepted the message that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, if they did, they didn't. If the Israel accepted the message that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, then John would fulfill the prophecy of Elijah. See, there was a prophecy in the Old Testament that Elijah was going to come before the kingdom. That's a prophecy. And what he's saying is, if the Jewish people will accept, and that's why he says this, if you accept this, then John is Elijah. Now, that doesn't make sense to us for a second, but he's saying this, if you will believe, if the nation of Israel believes that Jesus is the Messiah, then John the Baptist will fulfill the ministry of Elijah. In fact, in Luke 1.17, it says, John the Baptist comes in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Now I want to show you something. Hold your place. Turn to Matthew 17. That's just a few verses over. Matthew 17. The same issue comes up again, and I want you to see what he means. I hope you grasp this. If you got questions, if it's not explained very well, uh, it, then come see me, and I'll help you understand it. I just want you to get this. John the Baptist came in the spirit and power of Elijah, and he offers the kingdom to Israel. And if they would believe that Jesus is the Messiah, if the nation of Israel accepted Jesus as Savior and Messiah, John would have fulfilled the ministry of Elijah. But did they? They did not. So John did not, and Elijah's still coming. Okay? Now that's all we got to say. Look over here in John, in Matthew 17, and look at verse 10. And the disciples ask him, Why does the scribe say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said, Elijah is coming, and he will restore all things. But I say to you, Elijah already came. What? And they didn't recognize him, but they did to him whatever they wished. So the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about who? John the Baptist. So I want you to understand something. Here's the point. John came in the power of Elijah, offering the kingdom. Israel rejected it. If the nation of Israel would have accepted Jesus Christ as Messiah, the kingdom would have come, and John would have fulfilled the role and ministry of Elijah. But Israel rejected, and John and Jesus were killed, and the ministry of Elijah and the kingdom is still future. So all Jesus says there when it says, if you're willing to accept it, John himself is Elijah who was to come. He's saying, if you would believe who I am, John fulfills Elijah's role, but they didn't. That's why it makes it a little complicated. Jesus actually says, if you believe in me as the Messiah and the King as a nation, then John is actually doing what Elijah is supposed to do. Because that was the prophecy that Elijah is going to come, or John came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Look how this passage ends. He said, he who has ears to ear, let them hear. Now, I used to read that, and when I first started studying the Bible, I thought, that's weird. Everybody's got ears. Well, he says, he who has ears to hear, that means you're listening, you're learning. You know, some people come to church, and you can ask them right afterwards, what was the passage today? And they don't even know. And then some people come, and they're taking notes, and they're saying, okay, what, what does that mean? Oh, John the Baptist, Elijah, I, got, I think I got it. You know, because they're studying it, they're digging it. And he says, if you got ears to hear, then listen to what I said. He's saying to them, if you will believe in me, 
as Messiah and Savior, John, the kingdom will come, and John will fill Elijah's role. But they didn't. They had ears to hear. Some of them did, some of them didn't. We have a ministry. How can we fulfill the ministry that God has given to each of us? As we go out these doors, we go into a community that does not understand the message of salvation. They do not understand that Jesus Christ is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, that he came the first time to die, he's going to come the second time to reign. We need to tell people clearly that they need to put their faith in Jesus Christ as their Savior. Trust in Jesus to give them eternal life. That's our role. Just like John the Baptist had a role, we have a role. So let me give you some applications and we'll close. First application, let's go back to the Word of God whenever we doubt. Listen, sometimes you're going to doubt. Sometimes you do. Don't feel bad about it. I, I remember reading some of the Psalms. You know, there's some Psalms that David wrote. And as he starts off, he says, I don't get this. Why are you doing this? I don't like this. This isn't right. This isn't working out right. This person over here is getting away with this. And then as he gets further in, he remembers and he goes, oh, yeah, but you are in control and you're working all things and everything's going to work out. So sometimes we doubt, but we always go back to the truth of the word of God. John, Jesus turns John to the Bible to prove Jesus Christ was the Messiah and King. Always go back to the scripture. Second big thing is just let's fulfill our role. The role as ambassadors. That's what we are. John's role was to announce the Messiah was coming. Our role is to announce that the Messiah has already come and that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. Listen, don't get to the end of your life and say, I never did share my faith. I was too scared to. I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. I knew that every week when we went to church, we thought, we taught that we were to go out and take the message of salvation, but I never did it. Don't get to the end of your life and say, I never did it. Make a decision that you're going to be ready to share your faith when you go out these doors. And if you say, I, I'm really, I don't think I'm ready yet, then take the 412, take the 22, come meet with, come get with me, I'll get with you individually, or I'll get with you some, somebody else individually with you, and they will train you so that you can feel confident when you go out these doors to take the message of salvation. Don't get to the end of your life and say, I should have done more, I should have shared my faith. We have that great privilege to announce that the Messiah has come.